everyone! Welcome to episode number 592 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. This week, model-based design and software-defined vehicles take center stage. My guest is Jim Tung, a MathWorks fellow, and Jim and I are discussing trends driving a push toward software-defined vehicles, the benefits of model-based design for SDV development, and the tools that engineers should consider for virtualizing vehicle behavior. Also this week, I investigate a new enhanced event camera developed by a team of researchers at the University of Maryland that was inspired by the movements of the human eye and could vastly improve how robots see and react to the world around them. (laughs) But first, please welcome Jim to Fish Fry. Hi, Jim. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. Happy to join you. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about software-defined vehicles today. So first, set the stage for us, Jim. What are the consumer expectations here and What is driving this push towards SDV? Well, first of all, there are some consumer expectations that have always been there with vehicles, good performance and reliable. But increasingly, there's an attention to wanting vehicles to be environmentally cleaner and ever safer. But there's another aspect as well, which is a continuity with our digital life. If you think about our phones, they're not just phones anymore. They're platforms that we rely on for many aspects of our life. And there's a goal in the automobile to have it perform in the same way, often capturing information that's in our phones, our appointments, our schedules, our contacts, our reminders, our interactions. And so to make it part of that digital life continuity. That makes sense. So tell me about this resulting impact on the development approaches for software-defined vehicles. There are many impacts on the development approaches, but I'm going to key on three. One is what's called the EE architecture, the electrical and electronics architecture of the vehicle. In the past, there were many dedicated ECUs that performed the functionality in the vehicles, probably 50 to 100 dedicated ECUs for the powertrain, the steering, the braking, the vehicle motion control, and so on. Those are dedicated ECUs that were safety critical, but these were resource-limited processors in terms of the power and in terms of the memory. So it's really difficult to develop software for those ECUs. Today, they're being replaced in many cases by more powerful zonal computers and vehicle computers that are really high-performance computers with AI, with FPGAs, with GPUs, as well as cores. And so from an electrical and electronics perspective, that's changing dramatically. A second aspect is that the software itself needs to be designed to be easily updated because it's going to be living and evolving during the life of the vehicle. In the past, they were called maybe signal-based architectures. We had algorithms that were perhaps scheduled by a real-time operating system or scheduler that just performed on the data as the data streamed into the microcontroller. Today, however, these architectures are becoming more service-oriented. It's a way to design the software and implement the software components so that each component can be called flexibly from other software components. They're also more independent, which makes them more easily updatable. And then third, software development approaches. There are many more software developers in the automotive industry now, and they're bringing with them the modern software development practices that are found in IT and other areas. These are sometimes called software factory approaches, much more focused on automation with continuous integration pipelines, incremental development using things like Git for repositories, and ways of storing the artifacts so that they can be updated to the vehicle in a secure way and also reused other projects. So those three aspects are all changing pretty dramatically in every automotive company. The other aspect is that there's increased need to virtualize the various aspects of the vehicle because you have software developers that want to move as fast as possible to create software. And they may not have access to the hardware. They may not want access to the hardware. But they do need to make sure that their software will interoperate cleanly and robustly and safely with the hardware components. And so virtualization of the hardware components is also a key aspect of this STV development approach. 
That makes sense. So what do you see is the benefit of model-based design for SVD development? Well, maybe I need to start by describing some of the established benefits of model-based design in automotive. Because model-based design has been used by automotive as well as other industries for decades now. Using models to simulate or to virtualize the vehicle dynamics, the interaction of the various subsystems, and the scenarios in which the vehicle needs to operate are all critical. And that virtual integration is really enabling a shift left of how you clarify requirements, how you make sure that you're exploring the design space to get to the right approach, and then virtually integrating those things before you go to hardware when it's much more difficult and expensive to fix those issues. So that's one aspect that's been a historical benefit of model-based design. A second one has been the automatic generation of code from the models. And that code is efficient, can be target optimized for the specific microcontroller or other processor, with at the same time the flexibility to generate code to different kinds of microcontrollers from different manufacturers, FPGAs and GPUs. So you avoid vendor lock-in by enabling that. And so when you take those capabilities and look at the SDV area, the simulations, the code generation, all the model-based verification validation approaches, which engineers have often done interactively, can be automated as part of those same software factory processes They can be incorporated as tasks into a CI pipeline very easily. A second aspect is that the software design can support those newer service-oriented architectures that are becoming the norm in automotive. The code generation itself needs to evolve, supporting C++, which is becoming more of a common programming language, not just C. And that enables the support for the zonal computers, the vehicle computers as well, still, as the legacy ECUs that you'll still find in the vehicles. And then the models can provide a virtualization, a testbed of the vehicle, its operating situation, the driving scenario, and so on, which enables the software developers, as they're writing code, to check to make sure the code is going to work in the right way in the different situations that are envisioned. So, Jim, how does leveraging the cloud with MBD benefit this development? Well, if you take all the various aspects of MBD that I just mentioned, they can all leverage the cloud. First of all, if you're running lots of simulations to explore the design options or to optimize the approach, the cloud is a wonderful place to scale up simulations and run lots of simulations in parallel. In many cases, the cloud is the customer's platform for doing automation. It's where they've chosen to put their CI pipelines, for example. The cloud is also a way to access huge amounts of data, perhaps data coming from the fleet of vehicles. And that data is often used to optimize performance of algorithms or to create new types of functionality that are data-driven and then model-based. And then interestingly, the cloud platforms, because they support ARM, or as in many cases, they provide a platform, a huge platform, that's instruction set similar to the microcontrollers you'll find in the processors in the automobile. And some of the cloud platform providers are also adding support for emulating the more specific ECU instruction sets as well. So the cloud going forward may offer a very promising additional opportunity to virtualize the entire vehicle and the driving scenarios at scale. And that provides a wonderful playground for doing the software development as well as the systems engineering. That's great. So, Jim, what tools should teams consider for virtualizing vehicle behavior, software, and system components and other scenarios? Well, Matrix has a range of tools ourselves for virtualizing the vehicle behavior, the subsystem components, all built on our MATLAB and Simulink platform. In addition, though, it's very important, MATLAB and Simulink can also integrate models in tools coming from other vendors. So that makes it easier to compose the larger virtualizations of the vehicle, of the driving behaviors, and of the situations from already available models, regardless of the tools in which they were created. And then MathWorks also has our Roadrunner platform, which is used for virtualizing driver scenarios, as well as the scenes that the vehicle systems will be detecting and perceiving objects from. Fantastic. All right, Jim, it is time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, since you haven't been on my show before, you get my standard off-the-cuff. Okay, so if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you have to have a passport to get there, what would you have? Well, I do spend a lot of time in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, so I do like fish fries. But (laughs) I will also say that I guess the meal I would really love would be dim sum in Hong Kong. 
And the reason is because dim sum is such a traditional Cantonese style of cooking and, and so on, wonderful sets of foods. But in Hong Kong, the chefs and the restaurants are always pushing the envelope. They're always using new ingredients. They're always using new preparations that both adhere to the philosophy and the approaches of dim sum. They sort of fit into the categories, but at the same time, they're always pushing the envelope of what could be done. So I love the combination of tradition and pushing the envelope that you find with dim sum in Hong Kong restaurants. I love it. That sounds fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Jim. This was super cool. Thanks, Amelia. I really appreciate it. Have you heard about the new event camera that could improve how robots see and react to the world around them? So, this new innovative camera system, developed by a team of researchers at the University of Maryland, is called the Artificial Microsaccade Enhanced Event Camera. And get this, it actually mimics the tiny involuntary movements used by the human eye to maintain stable and clear vision. So how is this new camera system different from normal camera technology we use every day? And what makes this new event camera so special? Well, Bao Tao He, a computer science PhD student at UMD and lead author of the associated research paper, explains the difference like this. Event cameras are a relatively new technology, better at tracking moving objects than traditional cameras. But today's event cameras struggle to capture sharp, blur-free images when there's a lot of motion involved. It's a big problem because robots and many other technologies, such as self-driving cars, rely on accurate and timely images to react correctly to a changing environment. So, we asked ourselves, how do humans and animals make sure their vision stays focused on a moving object? So the key is something called micro saccades. Okay, so when you're focusing your view, a micro saccade is the quick, small eye movement that happens involuntarily to focus your view. These continuous eye movements allow us to focus on an object and observe its visual textures, like depth, shadowing, and color. So this team thought, well, if our eyes need these kinds of movements to focus accurately on objects, what if we could design a camera to use a similar principle? And that's exactly what they did. This team was able to successfully replicate these quick involuntary eye movements by inserting a rotating prism inside their enhanced event camera to redirect light beams captured by the lens. The continuous rotational movement of the prism actually simulates the movements within the human eye and allows the camera to stabilize the textures of a recorded object. The team then developed software to compensate for the prism's movement within the camera to consolidate stable images from the shifting lights as well. This is a huge step toward robotic vision. And this event camera innovation could go much farther than robotic applications. This camera technology could also be used in smart wearable applications and could have a lasting impact on camera technology as a whole. Cornelia Furmuller, a senior author of this paper, explains the benefits of their new event camera technology like this. These have distinct advantages over classical cameras, such as superior performance in extreme lighting conditions, low latency, and low power consumption. These features are ideal for virtual reality applications, for example, where a seamless experience and the rapid computations of head and body movements are necessary. 
An early testing of this new enhanced event camera is showing real promise. It was able to capture and display movement accurately in a variety of contexts, including human pulse detection and rapidly moving shape identification. These UMD researchers also discovered that this camera could also capture motion in tens of thousands of frames per second, outperforming most typically available commercial cameras, which capture 30 to 1,000 frames per second on average. This kind of realistic depiction of motion, which is much smoother than traditional cameras, could be groundbreaking when it comes to creating more immersive augmented reality experiences, better security monitoring, or even improving how astronauts capture images in space. <laughs> this team sums up their research like this. Our novel camera system can solve many specific problems, like helping a self-driving car figure out what on the road is a human and what isn't. As a result, it has many applications that much of the general public already interacts with, like autonomous driving systems or even smartphone cameras. We believe that our novel camera system is paving the way for more advanced and capable systems to come. Wow. So if you want even more information about this new enhanced event camera research from the University of Maryland or more information about software defined vehicle development, the use of model based design and cloud technology for software defined vehicles from MathWorks, I've included a slew of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me. <laughs> and of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of July 26th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>